Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for the Bible study session tonight. We come before you willing to learn, wanting to receive what you have for us. And therefore, Lord, we are praying and pleading that your spirit will impress your word upon our hearts, instruct and teach every one of us in Jesus' name. We pray that these words will be quickened and made alive so that we'll be able to learn what you have for every one of us in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. Tonight, we continue our study from the book of the Psalms. And we're studying Psalm 32. I want to read with you from verse 1. Blessed is he who transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. When I kept silence, my bones wax old through my running all the day long. For day and night, thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledged my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. For this, Shall every one that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found? Surely, in the floods of great waters, they shall not come near unto him. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. I will instruct thee and teach thee thee in the way which thou shalt go i will guide thee with mine eye be ye not as the horse or as the mule which have no understanding whose mouth must be held in with beech and bridle lest they come near unto thee many sorrows shall be to the wicked but he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about. Be glad in the Lord, and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. This psalm that we have read together just now, that we have titled, Pardon for the Penitent, was intended to instruct the soul under conviction, how to find pardon, how to receive peace with God, and how to have the peace of God. It is to teach the saint that he is the one who has been pardoned, how he can be compassed about with the songs of the redemption, the song of salvation, the song of joy. And a song of deliverance. Here the psalmist teaches sinners to repent. Because he himself had tasted the blessing of forgiveness. That's what he promised or what he said in another psalm. In Psalm 51. Verses 12 and 13. Restore unto me. The joy of thy salvation. And uphold me with thy free spirit. Then, after he had received forgiveness. After I was sure that his own transgressions had been rubbed away. Blotted out. Taken away. Then, will I teach transgressors thy ways. And sinners shall be converted 
unto thee. And here, he gives lessons to all men, princes, priests, and people, everyone. To men, to women, and to children, to everyone. And it is important that the lessons we have in the psalm, we learn. In fact, without learning, this lesson as contained in this psalm, whatever other lessons in life we learn, will be unprofitable on the last day. The psalm is divided into four parts to make us be able to grasp the lessons being taught in the psalm. Part 1, verses 1 and 2, pardon with conversion. Part 2, verses 3 to 5, the pangs or the pain of conviction. Part 3, verses 6 and 7, prayer with confidence. Part 4, verses 8 to 11, pleadings with all classes. That is, the pleading of the Lord with all classes of people. Let's look at point one. Verses one and two. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. As you look at the scriptures, especially when you read in the New Testament, you will discover that the nugget of the gospel, the core of the gospel, the centrality of the gospel message had been preached in the Old Testament, only that it is more clearly revealed in the New Testament. Here is the core of the gospel. Here is the message of justification by faith. And in fact, Martin Luther, the father of the Reformation, when he discovered the truth that the just shall live by faith, he did all he could do to spread that message abroad in preaching, in writing, and in getting some people around him that he discipled that he passed the message of the gospel to, so that faithfully, they too, they could tell other people. In one of the times that he got them around, he always did it every day, we are told, by theologians and historians. And on one of these occasions or sessions, that Martin Luther had the people around him, and they asked him a question. They said, in the Psalms, which of the Psalms will you consider as the greatest? And he said, the Pauline Psalms. That is, the Psalms that contain the revelation of the gospel as revealed unto Paul, the Pauline Psalms. And they wanted to know, they asked him, which of the Psalms will you regard as the Pauline Psalms? And the first he mentioned, he mentioned about four. The first that he mentioned is Psalm 32. Why did he mention Psalm 32? Because those two verses we have read contain the message of the gospel. In fact, Paul quotes it in Romans chapter 4. From verse 6. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. You know that the epistle to the Romans talks about the gospel, the message of the gospel. It's at the beginning of this 
epistle, the epistle to the Romans, that it said in chapter 1, verse 15. So then, as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. And immediately he began to preach the gospel to the Romans. Look at verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. What is the gospel? Salvation to the one that believes on the Lord Jesus Christ. Further on, verse 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And so he preached the gospel. And in the fourth chapter, which I have read to you already, he emphasizes again that righteousness comes not by works, not by generosity, giving money to the beggars, not by pharisaic attitude, trying to follow the rigid laws as interpreted by the Pharisees. And it is not by paying any amount of money to the church, to a club, or to the unfortunate in society. It is not by any religious ritual or rite that anyone will do or has done. We receive righteousness on the basis of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is why he emphasized, and he said, even as David described the blessedness of the man unto whom the Lord imputed righteousness without works, without rituals, without generosity, without the good deeds, but just by faith in the Lord. It says in verse 9, Romans chapter 4 verse 9, Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned unto Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet been uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that the righteousness might be imputed unto them also. You see, as I emphasized yesterday in the Sunday worship, that when you come to the Lord as a sinner, you come for a great exchange. You hand over your own sin unto the Lord. And he hands over unto you his own righteousness. Not because of anything that you have done. Not because of any good deed of your hand. Not because of whatever you have done well in the past. It is only by the grace of God. Mercy unmerited. Grace unmerited favor unmerited that the righteousness of the lord is imputed unto you look at it from verse 22 romans chapter 4 therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. 
So then, when we say that Jesus is our Savior, he doesn't look at all the good things we have done. The reason he saves us is that we are sinners. We have been sinners. If there is anything that qualifies us, qualifies anybody for salvation, it is a sin that you committed that made you qualified for salvation. It is the dirt that you had on you that made you qualified to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. If you are clean, you don't need the cleansing. If you are righteous already, you don't need his righteousness to be imputed and imparted unto you. If you are good already, you don't need the Lord and the Savior to make you good. But you will never be good enough yourself to make heaven. Your deeds will never be clean enough, many enough, to qualify you to make heaven on your own. And knowing that everybody is unqualified and disqualified because of our sins, because of our guilt, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but he has everlasting life, eternal life. So then, all you need to do is to come under the covering, the shelter, the refuge provided by the blood of Jesus. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5. Verse 30 and verse 31. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you slew and hanged on a tree. Him as God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior. For to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. To give, to give, not to pay. Because we're not buying it. We're not qualified for it. He gives repentance and he gives forgiveness of sin. It is a gift. It is by the grace of God. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. We have the forgiveness of sins, not according to the abundance of our good works. Not according to the height of our knowledge. Not according to the greatness of our generosity. Not according to the spotlessness of our self-righteousness. But in whom we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace that is why it's the good news the glad tidings the gospel that whosoever will may come none is so poor none is so sinful none is so depraved that he cannot come the mercy of god the goodness of god the grace of god invites everyone whosoever will may come pardoning mercy is of all things the most to be prized or to be valued for it is the only way to happiness self-righteous Pharisees have no part have no portion in this blessedness it is over the returning prodigal that the word of welcome is pronounced that the full instantaneous pardon is given it has caused the Lord our Savior, his very life, the shedding of his blood, to bear our sins away. In Christ's atonement, we have propitiation. That is the covering, the taking away of our sin, the making an end of our sin. Let's go back to Psalm 32. Verse 2. Blessed is the man 
unto whom the Lord imputes not iniquity. That means, the moment you are born again, the Lord does not have any iniquity in your account anymore. He looks at you now as if you never, never, never sinned. Your mind may remember your sins once in a while. God never remembers. Even unbelievers and neighbors may point at your past old way of living. God never remembers anymore. The people you offended, even when you have made right everything, according to the grace of God in your life, they may still remember because they are human beings. But God imputes not iniquity or sin or transgression to the one who has truly genuinely given himself to the Lord and has claimed the grace of God, the righteousness of the Lord. And it says, in whose spirit there is no guile, free from guilt, is also free from guile. Let's go to point two. From verses three to five, the psalmist now looks back a little. He tells the story of what happened to him before he received pardon before he received forgiveness he had been under conviction before his conversion let's look at it psalm 32 verses 3 to 5 when i kept silence my bones waxed old through my running all the day long for day and night Thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledged my sin unto thee. Mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And thou forgavest mine the iniquity of my sin. I want you to notice here that the psalmist was talking in the past tense. Look at verse 3. When I kept silence, it was something of the past. It was only retelling the story to help other people that might be in the same predicament. Look at verse 4. Day and night thy hand was heavy. It was something of the past. And in verse 5, I acknowledged my sin. It was something of the past. What he was saying is this. When sin came into his life, by carelessness, he said he did not immediately and promptly confess and forsake. He tried to cover it up. But then he remembers now that when I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my running all the day long. It was the pain of conviction, the pangs of conviction. And he told the experience so that he can instruct other people to be quick, to be prompt, never to delay in giving up their simple ways. Sometimes through neglect. Sometimes through the discouragement and despair. The sinner fails to confess immediately and to seek pardon from the Lord. At such a time, there will be grief. And the grief may become so intense as to sap its health and destroy its vital energy. That's what the psalmist is saying. He said, the sin, the conviction, the pain, the pangs were killing me, destroying me. They were like a loathsome disease within my spirit, like fire in my bones. The pain of conviction was so much, he describes it in another place, in Psalm 38. Psalm 38, from verse 2. For thine arrow stick fast in me, and thy hand presseth me sore. There is no soundness in my flesh. 
because of thine anger. Neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sins. That is what happens to a man or to a woman who is living in sin. But the Spirit of God has been striving with that soul, convicting that soul. There will be no soundness in the flesh. It will feel the heavy hand of the Lord. Conviction will look like arrows fastened to the heart or to the mind. It will bring sorrow. It will bring despair. It will bring so much conviction that it will be terror in his heart. In verse 4, for my iniquities are gone over my head. As an heavy body, they are too heavy for me. My wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. I am troubled. I am bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long. For my lungs are filled with a loathsome disease. And there is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and so broken. I have roared by reason of the disquietness in my heart. That is the body. That is the feeling. That is the pain. That is the terror. That the backslider or the sinner feels until he becomes penitent, repentant. And he goes before the Lord to confess and to forsake a sin. Verse 17. For I am ready to halt. And my sorrow is continually before me. For I will declare my iniquity. I will be sorry for my sin. That conviction is to lead to repentance. Is to lead to confession and forsaking of the sin. So that eventually the sinner or the backslider comes. Driven by the hand of God. Convicted by the spirit of God. Is driven to his knees to say, I will be sorry for my sins. I will confess. Acts chapter 2. Verses 36 and 37. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. Peter spoke to these people, the Jews. He reminded them of what they did against the Lord, against Christ, the Prince of Life, the Son of God, Christ the Messiah. And as he painted the picture before them, that they crucified the Lord and the Christ. The picture of their wickedness passed before their face again. The picture of their evil, of their hatred, of their malice, of their false witnessing, of the betrayal came on their mind again. The picture of the sorrowful dying Christ on the cross of Calvary came before them again. The picture of how they nailed him to the cross with brutality and wickedness, with envy and jealousy. All the evil things they did to the Lord, against the Lord, sinning against the light. It came before them again and it brought conviction, pain, sorrow, terror, arrows of the Lord in their heart. That's why it says in verse 37, now... When they heard this, they were preached in their heart. And they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? When you feel the conviction of sins committed, sins unconfessed, sins not pardoned yet, that's what it does in the heart. It makes you to go before the Lord in great Deep agony of sorrow for sin. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, reading from verse 8. For though I made you sorry with a letter, 
I do not repent, though I did repent. What Paul the Apostle is saying here, if you do not understand the way he uses the word repent two times, he may be feeling that he contradicted himself. What happened is this. The Corinthian church had allowed sin in their midst without checking the sin, judging the sin, casting out the sinner, dealing with the offender. A young man had lived in immorality with the father's wife. They knew about it. They did nothing about it. And Paul wrote a strong, stern letter unto them. He rebuked them. And then he said, I do not repent for doing that. Because I needed to do that to bring you under conviction. But then he said, although I felt sorry, I felt sad, I felt unhappy because they were his children in the Lord. His commission or his commitment was always to make them happy, to show his love to them. So he said that he was sad and sorrowful. He was unhappy that he needed to write unto them in such a firm, stern manner. That's why he said, though I did repent, though I felt unhappy the way I wrote unto you. But then he said, on the other hand, I do not regret. I do not repent. Because I knew that I should have written something like that to you. Verse 8, for I perceive that the same epistle had made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice. Not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, not to be regretted of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold, they self same thing, that ye sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you, yea. What clearing of yourself, yea. What indignation, yea. What fear, yea. What vehement desire, yea. What zeal, yea. What revenge. In all things, ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. What Paul the Apostle is saying is this. When he received the letter that contained his message that told them they were puffed up, they had not done right, that now they should purge out the old leaven, that they may become unleavened and clean and pure before the Lord, they were sorry. They felt convicted. The arrows of conviction was fastened into their hearts. They were so sorrowful and it brought real conviction within them. But that made them to pray. That made them to put right the things that were wrong. And then Paul said they became careful after that. They walked carefully. They looked carefully. They searched carefully in their midst. If there was any sin, they dealt with it now before Paul will talk to them sternly again. They cleared themselves. They had indignation against sin. They had fear. They wanted now to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. They had vehement desire and zeal for the Lord now. And then they revenged on the devil. The time that he had wasted from them the attention that he had taken, and they revenged on sin. They put sin away firmly in their midst. So he said, the conviction did something good in you. Let's go back to Psalm 32. From verse 6 and verse 7, prayer with confidence. For this shall everyone 
that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come near unto him thou art my hiding place thou shalt preserve me from trouble thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance now the psalmist looking over the whole experience the period of conviction the time of confession and the experience of conversion with iniquity taken away transgressions removed forgiveness given redemption made available righteousness given unto him given to his account imputed unto him now with the peace of god in the mind he rested he relaxed he rejoiced in the lord and he now speaks about a testimony and he encourages other people as well and he said for this because of this grace of god this mercy of god this pardon by grace favor unmerited everyone that is godly shall pray unto thee it encouraged him to pray and it was encouraging other people to they ought to pray but then he also mentioned something very important that they will pray in a time when thou mayest be found one he was referring to the fact that he found the lord he found mercy from the lord he prayed at the right time it wasn't too late for him mercy was still available when he prayed and in that he encourages you and encourages me that we ought to pray when mercy is still available there are some people that will pray too late like the rich man in hell he lifted up his eyes he asked for mercy he asked for water he asked for the cooling of the tongue it was too late then he asked for lazarus to please go and speak a word a word that will bring conviction to the people back at home he prayed too late like the song that was seen the wailing and the weeping and it talks about the people they prayed but their prayer was too late and so here the psalmist was saying pray but don't let it be too late seek the lord at a time of mercy in Isaiah chapter 55 verse 6 and verse 7 seek ye the lord while he may be found call ye upon him while he is near let the wicked forsake his way and let him do that while the lord may be found today and let the righteous man forsake his thoughts let him do that today while the lord may be found let him return unto the lord when today and he will have mercy upon him and to our god for he will abundantly pardon in second corinthians chapter 6 second corinthians chapter 6 verse 2 for he says i have heard thee in a time accepted and in the day of salvation have i so called thee behold now is the accepted time behold now is the day of salvation in psalm 32 on the account of god's pardoning mercy the grace and the favor of god unmerited the psalmist became hopeful and more trusting remarkable answers to prayer quicken the prayerfulness of other godly persons where one man finds a golden nugget others will feel inclined to dig. the benefit of our experience to others is very great and here david made the benefit of his own experience available to other people he said 
I sought the Lord. I found mercy from the Lord. You too, you can pray. He said, I sought pardon. You too, you can seek the pardon of the Lord. But he said, I sought it at a time of mercy. I sought it, I did not delay. I sought it, and I sought fervently from the Lord. You too, you can seek. But he does not only have an encouragement for believers, for sinners. He has for believers, for godly people. And he says, you can seek the Lord for other things too. Like sanctification or the holiness experience. But seek in time. Don't delay too long. And after you have been sanctified, you can seek the Lord too and be baptized in the Holy Ghost. But seek on time. Don't seek too late. Or if you need to be strengthened, encouraged, and empowered to walk in the way of the Lord. Seek for the strength of the Lord. But seek in time. Don't seek too late. Or if there is responsibility God has given you. Like the responsibility of making right things that are wrong in your life. And you need the grace of God to do it. Seek in time. Don't seek too late. That's why he said for this. On account of the mercy of God that I receive. Everyone that is godly can pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. He tells us we shall seek while we can find him. Wise people will pray while the Lord has promised to answer. Those who are not wise postpone their petitions till the master of the house has risen up and he has shut the door. And then their knock is too late. Between the time of sin and the day of punishment, mercy rules the hour. That means mercy is available and God may be found. But when, once the sentence has gone forth, pleading will be useless. Therefore, sinner, do not slight the accepted time. Pray without delay. Backslider. Do not waste the day of restoration and salvation. Do not delay any longer. Call upon him while he may be found. And then will there be the song of joy, the song of redemption, and the song of salvation, the song of redemption and deliverance in your mouth. That brings us to the last point. From verse 8. Pleadings with all classes. That is, pleadings with all classes of people. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. The Lord here was talking to the pardoned sinner, to the returned prodigal son, to the restored backslider. And if you are wondering, now I am forgiven. Now my sins have been taken away. Now my iniquities are not remembered anymore. Now the Lord has imputed righteousness unto me. How will I live? How will I work? How will I behave? What will I do now? Because I want to live the rest of my life. In the, to the glory of God. How will I be able to live now. So that I do not get back into the mud. Into the vomit. Into the dirt I left behind. Then the Lord says. I will instruct you. The spirit of the Lord within you. Will be speaking within you. Guiding you saying. This is the way. What key therein. How does the Lord instruct. Look at Second Timothy chapter 3. From verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And is profitable for doctrine. For reproof. For correction and for instruction in righteousness. That's how the Lord guides. That's how he teaches. That's how he instructs. He reminds you of his word. And through his word... You are given the enlightenment and the grace to live a righteous life. In Psalm 119. 
Psalm 119, from verse 9 to verse 11. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word? With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. After we have come to the Lord, after the backslider has been restored, the Lord promises him, the believer, that he will instruct him and teach him in the way he should go. What way? The way of righteousness, the way of holiness, the way of integrity. And then in verse 9, Be ye not as the horse, or as the mool, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with beech and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. He now instructs another kind, another class of people. The people that hear the word of God, and they do not immediately respond. He's pleading with them. He's saying, do not be like the horse or like the mule, in whose mouth we have to put the bit and the bridle. He says, be quick in responding to the word that you have heard. Hebrews chapter 3, from verse 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end, while it is called today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your heart, as in the provocation, or the day of provocation. Here he pleads with people that appears to have been hardened, the people that neglect, the people that delay, the people that are waiting for chastisement from the hand of the Lord before they give themselves over completely. He says, be not as a horse. Do not wait for the thunder. Do not wait for punishment. Do not wait for chastisement from the Lord. Do not be like the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding, whose house must be held in with beat and bridle lest they come near unto thee. And in Psalm 32, verse 10, many sorrows shall be to the wicked. He wants the people that are rejoicing in their wickedness, thinking that there is gain in their unrighteous, sinful ways. And he reminds them, many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusted in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about. He pleads with everyone that if you are yet to be saved, make this period, this time, this night, the day of salvation. If you are yet to be restored from your backsliding, make today the day of reconciliation with God, restoration unto the Lord. If you know that you have been indulging in one kind of sin or the other, do not wait till tomorrow. Tomorrow may be too late. Call upon him. If you will trust in the Lord, mercy is still available. And then in verse 11 he says, Be glad in the Lord. Remain in the Lord, then be glad in the Lord. And rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. It starts with the conversion of the believer, of the one that has given himself to the Lord. And he ends with commitment to walk in righteousness of heart, uprightness of heart and life. The Lord wants us to get this lesson very well. 
and to call upon the name of the Lord at this time of mercy. We'll rise up on our feet now. We'll talk to the Lord in prayer. If you have been hiding your sin, call upon the name of the Lord. If you have been excusing your sin, call upon the name of the Lord. Do not allow the thunder of the judgment of God to strike. There is mercy today. There is favor today. The grace of God is available today. The blood of Jesus is still flowing freely for the people that will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Restoration is still possible. Redemption is still possible. Call upon the name of the Lord. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Are you a prodigal son? Return home. Are you a prodigal daughter? Return home today. Are you a backslider? Be restored into fellowship with Christ today. Do not neglect the mercy of God. Do not waste the day of mercy. Do not wait until judgment will come from above. Do not neglect the heavy hand of the Lord upon your heart, the conviction of sin in your heart. Let it lead you to repentance. Let it lead you to having the mercy of God and the grace of God. Pray while there is mercy. Call upon the Lord while he's near. While the conviction is deep and fresh on your heart, call upon the name of the Lord. And as the Lord is teaching and instructing and guiding you to walk in the way of righteousness, walk in the way of integrity, walk in the way of holiness, be obedient to the teaching, 